We are streaming live at AWS reInvent in the Venetian. My name is Nikki, I'm a technical evangelist at AWS. I'm joined by Paul, Kevin, and Paul there on the end. Um, these guys are from the Amazon S3 team here to talk about some of the launch announcements from yesterday. Before we start, please introduce yourselves. Tell us what you do. I'm Paul Franklin. I work on Amazon S3 Glacier, and I'm a principal engineer. Principal engineer. Uh, and I'm Kevin Miller, the uh, general manager for Amazon Glacier. Uh, and I'm Paul Megan, I'm a principal product manager on S3. So before we talk about what's launched yesterday, yeah. um, can you discuss briefly what Amazon S3 is for those not familiar? Yeah, absolutely. So Amazon S3 is uh, cloud storage for the internet. Customers can use uh, S3 to upload really any type of data. Uh, they can ingest it from <coughs> anywhere in the world, store it in one of our 19 regions around the world, and, and then access it from anywhere. You know, with, with S3, uh, when, when customers write data to S3, uh, before we actually even say that it's been accepted, it's already been replicated to three different data centers within a region, wow. and so it's very durable data. Customers use it to store log files, uh, website content, photos, videos, uh, machine learning training data, IoT sensor data, really just any kind of data that customers have. We, you know, it's very common to see uh, S3 used for, for data lakes, uh, for example, where customers you know, use that as their point uh, for, for the data and then have a lot of analytics and other applications around it. And then one other thing I wanted to briefly mention about S3 is that we have uh, six different storage classes in S3. And what a storage class is- I was is, just about to ask you, what is Amazon S3 Glacier? Yeah, exactly, well that's a great segue. So uh, we have six different storage classes in uh, S3, and each storage class allows customers to tell us that uh, you know, certain data uh, may be accessed less frequently or need less durability, right. and so they can save money on their storage costs when they use a storage class. So the Amazon S3 Glacier storage class is one such. Um, it's still uh, three data center durable. It's, it's you know, 11, what we call 11.9's durable, uh, but customers can save uh, more than 80% uh, on storage costs using Amazon Glacier. And in exchange with Glacier, instead of the sort of millisecond level access that you might get with, or you do get with Amazon S3 standard. Right. Uh, with Glacier, it's uh, there's three different retrieval speeds, and expedited is just one to five minutes. Uh, standard is uh, three to five hours, and then bulk is five to 12 hours. Okay, got it. So Glacier is for file types that you're accessing infrequently. That's right. Uh, cold archives, uh, customers have large you know, video archives where uh, they're pulling a little bit of the data all the time, but you know they're not they're not accessing the whole archive on a daily basis. So um, it's a great storage class for that. Or you know, for logging data where you might want to just keep it because you might go reprocess it, maybe run some machine learning down the road, uh, and just to hold on to that data to have it. So. so what new features and capabilities did you launch at reInvent? We've been doing a lot, there's a lot going on with uh, S3 and Glacier here. We've uh, really excited about it. So there's a, a few things I want to talk about today, and actually I'm going to have Paul demo this here shortly. But uh, Ooh, we lost demo. Uh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> we'll do a live demo. So three big features, one is what we call direct put to Glacier, uh, it's a way to really, uh, for customers who know that the data needs to go straight into Glacier, they just, they make that put request to S3 and say, I want this in Glacier, it goes right there, there's no need to have any other life cycle policies. Awesome. Um, so it's a really cool feature, we'll demo. Um, also I have two other things, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot from customers who want to build uh, applications around cold storage, so they you know, they know they have some colder data and they want uh, an, a whole workflow around it, and so we have what we call restore speed upgrade, which is a way that when they're getting the data data back if they if they start by saying I need it you know at bulk speed five to twelve hours but then maybe another request comes in and they need it faster uh, they can just come back and say I need it expedited and then oh, one wow. to five minutes they'll have the data back that's the uh, second feature and then third is uh, we have what we call restore notifications which is a, a way for customers to uh, sort of build an event driven application with cold storage so uh, the data comes uh, they request they restore the data, they initiate the restore. As soon as the data is available, we send a notification, and then they can trigger, for example, Lambda function to just kind of continue the workflow um, uh, from there using that storage. So, awesome. um, so we're going to actually turn it over to Paul and do yeah, a demo. Yeah, let's see this demo. Here, so. Super sure. excited. So, um, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, put an object that we need. So, just make sure. Um, we do have one quick question while this demo is happening. Yeah, while he goes from through, yeah. Adival, is RRS still available for S3 lifecycle policies? Yeah, RRS is our reduced redundancy storage. <laughs> um, you know, it, it is still available, uh, absolutely. We also actually just this week launched S3 intelligent tiering, uh, which uh, you might take a look at as well. Uh, intelligent tiering automatically uh, moves data into uh, our, our standard infrequent access uh, when um, for, for data that we know is uh, not accessed as frequently. Uh, but yes, RRS is definitely still available. So okay, so 
here I've put the object and I've specified the storage class Glacier directly. This is our cool. direct put to Glacier. Um, Just by adding this parameter storage class Glacier. Correct, this is really exciting. It used to be that you had to put it as a different storage class and uh, know or trust that you had a lifecycle rule Policy. somewhere else that would say move it over to Glacier. Right. right. Now, for many use cases, it's actually simpler to specify the storage class up front and you just know that right, right. You're, you're directly specifying what will happen. And, and you it just happens. put the object straight in as a glacier right. object. And so here we did a head and you see that the storage, storage class, class is, is indeed glacier. glacier. Yeah. Um, we'll try to get it, and I say try, this is uh, one of the consequences of glacier is you actually can't get it immediately, right? Uh, Kevin talked about this, the retrieval tiers. Uh, so it right. says, oh, you can't get it right now, basically. The, uh, the storage class doesn't let you get it. So uh, I'm going to kick off a restore. Uh, right, this is, this is exactly what you'll see when you, because the data is sitting in cold storage, you just have to initiate a restore first, and then you can get the data back, so. Right, so issue the restore So you're request. restoring the object. Right, uh, and then I can do a head on it again, and it says uh, that there is an ongoing restore request. Ah. So that tells us that there's already a restore in flight. Now, we realize, wait a minute, this is a demo, we're live. Right. <laughs> we can't wait we can't three wait five for hours. Yeah. No, right? that's, just we, not that's too long. So, and uh, previously, we would be stuck. There's an ongoing restore request, we couldn't issue a new one. But uh, with what we've announced uh, yesterday, I forget which day. It's as uh, yeah, I'm losing we track. This, yep. uh, um, so That's what we happens can, when you're at reInvent, you lose track of the days. I yeah, know. so I issue a new restore request. Oh, and I have a stray, I have a copy paste bug. Hold on it. Um. <laughs> there's any questions? Yep. So you notice I've specified the expedited tier here. Yep. That will speed it up um, there. Wow, there we it's go. a little bit so hard to see no matter what color. So then now use. how fast until we can get it again? So this will take uh, one to five minutes. Oh, okay. And uh, I should note before this demo, I purchased provision capacity with Glacier. We right. do have limited capacity for expedited requests. And so by purchasing provision capacity, yep. Uh, I have a specific degree of confidence that that expedited capacity is available. Yep. So we'll check on this a little bit later. Yes. See yep. if we're able to retrieve the object. All right, so while that goes, yeah. So what else um, did you guys launch yesterday? Yeah, so the last thing that I wanted to mention, uh, so you know, Paul mentioned direct put to Glacier, uh, or we talked about that a minute ago, and and you know, again for cold archive or for cold applications, uh, cold storage applications, you know, directly putting uh, data into Glacier is a great way to um, to, to to put it right in there. But uh, we have also launched uh, cross-region replication to direct to Glacier. So for example, for customers who want to make a, a tertiary copy of data or or just another copy in another region. Uh, it's now really easy to do that. You can configure a uh, cross-region replication rule and just say target storage class is Glacier and then uh, the S3 handles, uh, takes care of the rest. We'll uh, automatically wow. replicate that uh, into Glacier in the other region. So for disaster recovery. Are we going to see recovery. a demo of that too? Uh, no, I don't think we're going to demo that today. We're going to let the uh, the other three uh, roll out here in, in Paul's demo. So. Yeah. so what else can developers do now with these new S3 features that they couldn't do before? Yeah. Well, why don't I take this? So, I mean, I think the, the well, how were they previously doing it? Yeah, so previously customers were, would configure uh, lifecycle rules uh, where the, the rule would say, you know, data that's a certain age or that has a certain tag, we want to move that over to Glacier. And now um, it's really, you know, our, our goal is to make uh, the S3 Glacier storage class um, as easy to use as our other S3 storage classes. So uh, we have, you know, as again, I said, we have six storage classes now, and we want it to be super easy for customers just to pick the specific storage class that's appropriate for the data. And, and customers actually can do that on an object by object level in S3, which is really powerful when you have a, a mix of data, some of it's hot, some of it's cold, so. Right. 
So I think you mentioned another feature that you launched called the Amazon S3 Object Lock. Yeah, we're actually going to turn it over to Paul so to talk a little bit about Object Lock. So. Do we want to finish off the demo first? Oh, yeah, let's check are, on are it. You, is, is the object, yeah. back? The object back? The object is back. Oh, let's check so, in with Paul. Wow. Yeah, so the object is back. Um, I checked on it while we that were talking. That was faster than five minutes. Well, one was to like five minutes. Minute. So yeah, sometimes it is one minute. It and it wasn't, clean. so you see here, the restore, it says the ongoing request is false, so it's not ongoing anymore. So now you it's can complete. get it. Yeah, and this is the expiry date. So if you're paying attention, you notice I said this restore request is for one day. Yep. So this is day. for roughly one day in the future. Uh, so you can only get the object now for a day, and right. then it'll expire? It turns out it's a bit over a day, right? We round up just. Yeah. Um, you can always we'll get it restored again. You just have to restore it a second right. time. But now and it's so, available immediately. So. Yeah, so that's our head, and now we can get it. Um, and if I do a directory, you can see that indeed we have our original here, and we have the one we got back from S3 Glacier. Wow. And they're the same size. So that's pretty cool. Perfect. All right. What are, uh, what Thanks, are some Paul. of the most popular use cases of, of all these features or some of the ones that we just watched, actually? Yeah, well, I mean, again, I think it's for, for customers who want to build a, f a full application where they know that they're going to use some cold storage. Again, you can save 80% plus on uh, storage using uh, Glacier. So if you already so, know you're going to be infrequently right. accessing the data, right. and then you could always just do what Paul just did and restore yeah. um, for quick access for right. a short amount of time. And then really build an event-driven application using our restore notifications so that you know you, you, need, a, you need to get the data back, you initiate it and then um, we take we sort of we hold on to it while we're doing the restore and then we send the notification and pick your workflow up right at the end so awesome yeah, yeah. all right let's see this other demo all right cool well so I'm gonna show s3 object lock um, a bunch of customers have data in s3 and glacier that has yeah. sort of natural retention periods right so backup and archive is one example of these workloads right. but there are others as well um, and what customers have asked us to do is to uh, help them you know lock those retention periods in and then enforce them in storage Right. So fundamentally, that's what S3 Object Lock does. It allows you to set up retention controls out across S3 and Glacier, uh, and then you know, put when you put data into the system, we'll go enforce those for you uh, over time. Right. Got it. So you can drill down to a specific object or even object version, set up a retention period on, on uh, at that level, or you can zoom out and set a default policy on your bucket, the and then bucket. every new object coming in is going to catch that, is gonna that, catch lock, that yeah. retention period and we'll block deletes while, while that retention period is, right. is in effect. Cool, okay. let's see it in action. All right, so uh, you know, I've got the S3 management console up here. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and drop a few files just into this Make brand sure. new bucket that has uh, object lock we enabled on it. We got a question yep. um, for the presenter. I think that's for me. <laughs> is it called Glacier because of a pun on cold storage or because retrieval times are glacial? glacial? Uh, it's cold storage. You know, we, we were looking for, uh, you know, I guess a good name uh, for something that's very cold, and obviously glaciers are, are pretty cold. So, how's uh, the bandwidth once the request goes through? Uh, so uh, we have customers that have uh, petabytes of data and then you know are able to retrieve that. Um, it, again, for expedited retrievals, we have the concept of a provision capacity unit, and each one of those. Uh, you know, pr uh, provides a certain amount of bandwidth, but uh, you know, for customers that have large archives that need to pull it back, um, they can do that. They can pull you know terabytes or petabytes of data back at some of our standard or bulk retrieval speeds. So, yeah, it's awesome. quite capable. Thank you, Mu Nine, for that question. Oh yes, thank you. All right, continue. Uh, all right, so I got a bunch of files here, a bunch of objects in S3. I'm going to go drill down into this one called Lock One, right? And now you you see I have this new object tile uh, in the S3 uh, management yeah, console lock. that I can drill down into, and I have some options. So we actually apply locks in one of two flavors. The first that you see here is governance mode, and that's sort of uh, uh, that's a lock that allows for a privilege delete, right? So if you're using ah. it for testing, if it's more for internal governance, that's a good option to use. We also have compliance mode, which is a straight up hard lock. You lock the object in compliance mode; it'll stay there for the the full Duration, retention period yeah. of yeah. the the full retention period of the object, right? So you see here we get to go set, you know, what is the uh, the retain until date, how long do we want this retention period to run, uh, and then save it in on the object. Throw some, uh, throw so a warning up there. So this is not just for customers that have legal and compliance requirements, is it? No, not at all. Any data that has a known retention period okay. works well with object lock. Yeah. So you could have sure. inter internal governance rules, like I must store my backup for 30 days. It's a great fit for object lock. We built it sort of compliance grade for those compliance use cases, but it's easy and flexible enough for anyone in S yeah. who uses it. Even S3 simple things like log files. You know, if you know you want to maintain your log files for six months, put a retain until date on it just to, to yeah. give yourself that extra assurance that you'll have that data. All right. 
So if I zoom back now to all of my objects, I'm actually going to pop this out and show all versions either, even of all my objects, uh, and come in and run a delete. Uh, just to clear out the bucket, you can see, hey, one of these guys is still here, and that, that's, the, that's the object that I went the in earlier yep. right. and locked up. And you can see yep. the same uh, drill down and you know, say, hey, why? It's because that retain until date that's right really cool. is yep. still there. Is this feature available in all regions? This feature is, is available in all regions today. Ship last For night. all storage classes, or? Uh, that's right, yeah, so th we actually apply the locks. Uh, we can apply the locks uh, in S3 and then manage that uh, lock as data moves into Glacier as well, right? So it works with life cycle transitions, that sort of stuff. Yep. Uh, for customers who are interested in compliance, we maintain compliance as well as objects move down this into This is a super cool Glacier. new feature. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. You guys launched several of them, so where can our customers go to learn more about these uh, new features? Well, we have a number of, of sessions, actually. If you're here at reInvent, you can go to a number of sessions around S3, um, so even sat some this afternoon, um, talking about storage management or um, some of the security best practices. We have a number of those. Um, and then we also have a, a blog post, which I think we're going to have a link to here. Uh, You'll see the link on the screen, that, hopefully, uh, shortly here. Yeah, that will show that uh, describes all the features in detail. So. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me today okay. on uh, you. Twitch. You're welcome. Um, anything else you want to add about these brand new features from the Amazon S3 team? No, well, I let's see if there's I, any last. Yeah, I was going to say, do we have any other questions? But yeah, we have two. All right. Um, Anise Wick asks, can I purge data from Glacier? without paying a retrieval fee. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, when you configure a lifecycle rule, you can set a deletion policy. Um, Glacier does have a minimum retention period of 90 days because, again, it's cold storage. Uh, and so, But uh, you can delete it any time. Uh, if you delete it before 90 days, you just pay up, up to that 90-day mark. But after that, you know, it's, it's free to delete it. So. Awesome. Kevin Miller. Um, That's me. Can, oh, I purge, sorry. <laughs> can I purge data? TD, or, <laughs> TD Malone. What happens if you apply compliance lock and then change your mind. Can AWS support undo it in any circumstances? So that's kind of why we introduced the feature with two separate modes, right? So for testing, we strongly recommend governance mode. But once you're in compliance mode, once you're locked in, you're sort of locked in, right? So that's a, that's a compliance yeah, thing, can. and that's what the regulators require. Yeah, we can't undo it. But the, the governance mode, just to put another, just to kind of clarify that as well, I mean, with governance mode, uh, we, we see a lot of applications for that where, for example, a customer might have a, a, com, you know, a compliance team or a security team who would sort of hold the keys to that, where you know, if you want to delete it, you can. It just, it, you just have to get additional approval internally, and then Got you it. can get it unlocked. So, um, so that's definitely the recommendation, because we we're not able to unlock it once it's in that compliance mode. So. Right. Obviously, yeah, so it looks like you can. Um, one last question I yeah. think we have. Uh, Paul Megan, oh, this question is specifically to Paul. Does lock object also prevent from editing those files? Uh, so we leverage versioning to protect against overriding any object, right? So object lock actually works with versioning. Object lock provides, itself provides delete protection and then it turns versioning on for you so that overrides are also protected. Your original record is, is protected from right. overriding. The original well. version can't be changed. That's right. Yeah. So you could edit it, but then it would just create a new version? Or? That's right. Okay, cool. That's awesome. I think that's all, all we have time for today, guys. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me, and congratulations on your new launch of features. Yeah, thanks um, for hosting us. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. We'll see you soon. Thanks.